You're listening to the Love Over Addiction Podcast. Well, hello. Thank you so much for agreeing to share your story with us. Absolutely. I'm very excited to be here and tell my story, and I really hope that it can help someone else because I know that the interview podcasts have really helped me. Mm, I love that. Yes, they they are seem to be incredibly popular, so I'm always so appreciative of anyone having the courage to step forward and share their experience. So what I like to do is start from the beginning and talk about um, when did you first meet your husband and how did you know there was a problem? But if that's not an appropriate place to start for you, please feel free to start anywhere you choose. Okay, perfect. So buckle up. (laughs) Here we go. (laughs) Okay, I'm ready. So my husband and I are both from a very small town outside of it's basically a suburb. Um, we went to the same high school, but and we knew who each other were in high school, but we didn't connect until college. So I was 19 and he was 22 at the time. Um, he had been out of town at a university. Um, he was in a fraternity, um, had a little too much fun partying and lost his scholarship. So his parents had him come back home to the local college. Um, to kind of get his grades in order before going back to finish his degree at the university where he started. Um, so during that summer, it was 2010, is when we walked past each other at college. It kind of seemed like fate at the time. Um, and like I said, we already knew who each other were, but we were friends on Facebook. And he messaged me on Facebook, asked how I was doing, and then it kind of transpired from there. We went on a date, and immediately we connected. He is very funny, and that was the first thing that I loved about him. He always makes me laugh. Um, He's very thoughtful, and like you usually say, um, one of the hardest parts about this disease is that it happens to really wonderful people. Um, So we're dating. We go on a date. We date throughout the summer. Um, shortly after we started dating, he mentioned that he occasionally smoked marijuana, and I did not go off to college. I stayed at our local college. So for me, I felt like I was more sheltered. Um, I didn't realize how recreational that was and how common it was. Uh, so he mentioned that to me. It it didn't freak me out or anything. I was just kind of like, oh, okay. You know, I was 19. I had just started kind of drinking underage and socially when I'd hang out with my friends and things. Um, And I didn't know the extent of his use with this at this time. So there were a few times that I smoked with him. I didn't understand the hype of it. I didn't like how it made me feel. And quickly he started putting that before me. And what I mean when I say that is I remember one time specifically I wanted to cook dinner for him. And Time went on, time went on. I didn't hear from him. I knew that he was hanging out with his friends. And come 10 o'clock, I hear from him. And I was just, from the beginning, just felt so lucky that he chose me. And am now realizing through my recovery, like, I've never really had any healthy boundaries with anyone in my life. And this is one of the instances. So he comes over at 10 o'clock at night. I had been waiting and waiting and waiting, but wanted to see him so badly that I didn't say, no, you're not coming at this point. He gets there. His eyes are bloodshot. Like, I know something's off. I'm not familiar with marijuana and people being high at that point, So I, but I knew something wasn't right. He wasn't in the same state that he was the other times that we were together. So that was the first moment that I knew okay, well, you're putting this before me. That's where the abandonment came in and the rejection I started feeling. And that was my first, like, sour taste of drugs came came in. Um, so I wrote a few bullet points, so I'm just trying to look at these as I go. Um, his And just a little background on him, his grandmother did struggle with addiction, and his aunt 
struggles with addiction um, pretty badly. Um, Mm. So in the end of that summer, so we had only dated a few months. He was going back to school. He got his grades up and everything. Um, And like I said, I did not know the extent of his marijuana use. I thought it was occasional because he hid that from me. Once I started getting upset about him choosing that over me, he started not telling me the truth about it. Um, so he, we broke up, he went back to college. Uh, we kept getting back together anytime he'd come back in town for holidays and things like that. Um, the marijuana, if I ever smelled it on him, that was always a fight in our relationship. And it was always me saying, well, you're going to quit, right? And he says, yes, I'm getting better. I'm not doing it anymore. And me saying, oh, okay. Like just never holding up my boundaries. Um, so we broke up for a good two years after we had gotten back together, broken up, gotten back together, and we both dated other people. Um, He moved back into town in 2014, and I was dating someone and broke up with them. And he, my husband, came back into my life and was wanting to take me out and everything. And I was like, listen, I am in school. I'm not going to let you ruin this for me. I know that I don't have boundaries with you, but I'm making one right now. Like I will not have someone that smokes weed and does all these things. So he was like, I haven't done it. Like I'm, I'm better now, blah, 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 blah. So we're back together. And for a good six months, it felt like, wow, this is the relationship that it's supposed to be. He's truthful with me. We're together all the time. He's committed to me finally. Like, we're in love. We're going to make this work. So six months in, um, there were a few times when something was just off for me. I just felt I couldn't prove that he was high, but I had a feeling. He'd come to my apartment when I moved in there, and just something about him wasn't right. Um, He didn't help me move into my apartment because he was supposedly working. He didn't, he wasn't there for me during an ER visit when I had to go because I had a kidney stone because he was working supposedly. And I just got this weird feeling. And one night he was spending the night at my apartment and he went to the bathroom and left his phone. And I got on his phone and I never liked to do this because I just always felt like I was always told, you know, if you're looking for something, you're going to find something that you don't like. Be a good girl. Mm-hmm. Don't, don't cause problems. Um, that came from my parents growing up. So mm-hmm. I went in this phone anyway, and I went back to the dates that I had suspected something was weird. And I actually found out that he was smoking weed with someone that works for him. At his, he does construction and owns a company in our small town and um, he was smoking weed with a girl at work and these text messages that I read were just someone that it was a completely different person than I knew and Mm -hmm. I'm shaking even thinking about it. Um, Mm -hmm. It was just heartbreaking and I just felt so betrayed and that he chose something over me and it felt like infidelity really. Um, I didn't really think that anything was physical going on with this girl or even emotional. It was just something that he was doing that he knew I didn't like and that was such an issue in our relationship that he chose to do with someone else other than me. Um, So I confronted him about it. Oh, and I also found out at the time I thought I was doing the right thing. I was like, I know who your drug dealer is. I know when you're doing it, who you're doing it with. You're going to stop. So I confronted him about it. And I asked him about it first and didn't tell him that I saw it in his phone. And he lied to me. And he told me, no, I'm not. Mm -hmm. And I said, yes, you are. I saw it in your phone. This is the day you did it. This is who you were doing it with. Blah, 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 blah. So I was really mad but never really started threatening to leave at that point. That came later. Um, I was just, like, heartbroken and was, like, begging him, you know, like, do you, I wanted him to see how much this hurt me. And I still have never been able to like, truly get him to grasp that. So time goes on, I'm going to look at my notes. Um, 
a little bit of time goes on, I think that he stopped because at this point it's not like, a, oh, I'm going to drug test you to know if you're really doing this. And it's not him going to say, oh, yeah, you know, I've been doing this and I feel bad about it. It was more of a, like, don't ask, don't tell. Like, if I ask about it and press really hard, he's going to eventually have to tell me the truth. But it was never forthcoming. Um, so fast forward, it's 2015, and he gets what we think is a stomach bug or food poisoning. Mm-hmm. It's so bad that he's in the shower all night long for, like, 12 hours. And he comes to me, and he's like, I think I need to go to the ER. And I'm like, yeah, I think so, too. I've never seen you like this. So we take him to the ER, and I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. I won't say where I work, but I am a nurse. <laughs> so I mm. do feel like I'm educated. <laughs> um, so we go to the ER. They run all these tests. They say, you know, it's not appendicitis. We guess it's just food poisoning. And at this point, they didn't mention a urine drug screen because I don't know if Anyone knows this, but anytime you go to the ER, most times they do a urine drug screen on you. They didn't mention anything to me. Um, he was not trying to hide anything from me. Um, he wanted me there with him. So that happened in 2015. Almost a year goes by, and he gets sick again. And I'm like, this is so weird. I've never known someone to get food poisoning this much. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. he's sick again, but doesn't have to go to the ER. But is begging to go. And I'm like, I really think you're fine, whatever. Like, that happened in March of 2016, and then, like, a few weeks later, he got sick again. So I was like, okay, like, you need to go to your primary care physician. So he goes, they do a physical on him, they draw his lab. And I haven't really mentioned the alcohol yet because it – at this point, he was more of, like, a social drinker, and he likes to drink a lot. Like, we like to go places. We like to go to breweries. We like to have a good time. Um, so it wasn't, that was never a point of fighting in our relationship. So mm-hmm. I get him this appointment, we go, he's willing, and they draw his labs, and they look at his bilirubin. And his bilirubin level, like, that's an indicator of things to do with your liver, and it's really increased. And I'm like, maybe that's, like, from his drinking. You know, like, we drink, we like to have a good time, but, like, I didn't – I never would classify him as an alcoholic at that point. So mm-hmm. I was concerned about it, and his doctor said, you know, don't drink for a few months, come back and do the lab. So then they were decreased. And his eyes are always, like, a little jaundiced, in my opinion. Um, but I also know as a nurse I can be a little bit of a hypochondriac. <laughs> so I tried to brush it off. Um, so then um, – he doesn't get sick again for a while. We get engaged that year. Everything's great. I did start to look for signs of him smoking at this point. So I'd kiss him and I'd, I'd like taste it on his breath. And if you've ever smelled marijuana, which I'm sure most of you have, you can smell it. And Mm -hmm. I would, he would try to just give me a peck when I would see him instead of kissing me with his mouth open. And I would try Mm -hmm. to get him to, like to test him just to see and now looking back I'm like oh my goodness like how did I not realize like this is not normal but you don't know what you don't know Mm -hmm. and so this started happening I caught him a few times smoking um he was even hiding it in like bricks behind our house like I didn't catch that but like when I pressed him hard enough he's like yes I did have it there because at this point I caught him I threatened to leave I left the house Um, my family didn't really know the extent of this. Um, they knew that he liked to smoke sometimes and knew that I didn't like it. So they were under the impression that I was like, that it was just very occasional. Um, Mm -hmm. so I threatened Steve and I confided in a friend about it who knew it had always been a problem with me. And because we were engaged, she encouraged me. She's like, you can't just leave the house like that when you're married. So she encouraged me to go back and work it out with him um, lovingly. You know, people that don't love someone mm-hmm. with addiction, I think, have no clue. Um, and they think they're trying to do the right things. But really, it kind of reinforces the thoughts that you already have in your head about, like, um, I need to do this. I need I need to do more. Um, so I go back to the house. He tells me all this information. Um, he actually has two brothers that are very close with him 
and I reached out to one of them who is married, and I said, this is really a problem because now he's confessed to me that he's doing this all day every day at work, and he owns a business, and we're getting married, and I'm thinking, okay, this is my livelihood too. Where we live, this is not legal. When I have children, I do not want this around my children. And I said, you know, he thinks that I'm the only one that has a problem with this. Like, can you please explain? Like, can you help me? Like, I think we need to do an intervention. Like, this is, he's doing this all day, every day. Um, his brother told me that he didn't want involved. So I was like, okay. I still didn't tell my parents what was going on. Um, my brother knew, but my brother kind of said to me, well, you know, you knew that he did that when you first started dating him. So, like, you either need to be okay with it or not. And I was like, but I kind of didn't. Like, if I had known that super early in our relationship, I don't know that I would have stayed. Um, and I didn't know the extent of it. So, fast forward, I think that he's quit again. We get up to our wedding. It's about a month before our wedding. And he starts getting sick. So we go to the ER because he's so sick that he has to go get fluids and get medication, Zofran, Finnergan, has to get Haldol, which is a psych med, to stop vomiting because of this cyclic vomiting that's happening. And we go, and, of course, I'm right by his side, and they ask him, do you smoke marijuana? And he says, I used to. I, I haven't smoked in about a month. And I, of course, think he's telling the truth because he he's really good at making you think that he's telling the truth. I still struggle with that. <laughs> um, so he says, I smoked about a month ago. Well, they don't come back and tell us the drug screen, but the doctor comes in and she says, you know, I'm pretty sure this is something called cannabis hyperemesis. Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with that, but basically in my research that I've done about it, it's happens a lot to more chronic smokers and because marijuana is not as synthetic as it used to be in like the 70s and things a lot of times all of a sudden people can start having an intolerance to it so like you you're nauseous mm -hmm. so you smoke marijuana because you think you're going to feel better but really that triggers a cyclic vomiting episode um and one of the symptoms is or one of the things that people do they get in the shower because a hot shower can relieve their symptoms and I'm like, oh, this is classic. This is what he's been doing. But I mm. but I also was just, like, still not believing it at that point, I guess. So she mentions it. We go home because he gets hydrated and we go home. He goes back to the ER two more times that week. The second time he needed to go, I was furious. I said, I'm not taking you. So his mom comes and she's like, well, I'm going to take him. Because he would get so panicked when he was sick, and he knew, like, he just gets so panicky, like, um, like, I'm sick, I know that this will fix it, I need to get there and do this. So, we, I go with him, because I'm like, well, there's no way that I'm letting his mom go with him. Like, I'm his, I'm his cheerleader, like, I'm his person, I'm the saver. So, I go with him, and they mention it again. And I'm like, he's telling you that he's not smoking marijuana. I am, like, as a nurse, I do know that I have witnessed and been guilty myself in the past of prejudgment on people. You know, you hear mm -hmm. alcoholic and you hear, you know, drug addict, and you think of somebody that's homeless on the side of the road. And that's not it at all. That's one of the biggest things that I've learned through all of this. Um mm -hmm. But I was frustrated because I thought that there was a stigma around him because he had, was being honest and admitted that he had smoked marijuana before, that now they're like, oh, you know, this kid's coming in here like this. So I was, like, taking up for him and being his advocate. So then they recommend that we see GI. So we go to GI. They do an endoscopy on him. And the doctor comes out to me. And at this point, um, he was drinking probably a bottle of wine a night, and I knew that there was, I was like, okay, something's not right here. When he would drink, he he's very kind when he's not drinking. And when he's drinking, he was never physically abusive to me, but he was very emotionally abusive, very passive aggressive, talked in circles. Mm -hmm. And I just was thinking, you know, well, he's not beating me. And it's not that bad. It's, it's only when he is drinking. 
Um, but there was a night before I got married where I was on the phone with my friend crying and I was in the closet and I was like, this is not okay. But I still at this point was like, well, it doesn't happen that often. So it's fine. Mm -hmm. Um, so he goes to get an endoscopy. We get done and the doctor comes and sits down with us and he says, how much do you drink? And he's very forthcoming. He, and that's why I thought he was, like, honest to a fault. I was like, well, he's telling the truth about this, but not the whole truth. And I didn't realize it wasn't the whole truth, if that makes any sense. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So the, the doctor says to me, or both of us, he said, you know, how much are you drinking? And he said, oh, about a bottle of wine a night. Like, it's no big deal. And the doctor looks at him, and he said, son, because that's what everyone says in the South, hmm. son, you are a functioning alcoholic. I've seen people like you. 20 years later, your esophagus looks horrible. And if you don't stop now, you won't be in good shape in 20 to 30 years. And I was like, it was the first time I had heard somebody describe him as an alcoholic. And I was a little bit in shock, but at the same time, I was not. And it felt so good to have somebody, a, a professional that maybe his family would listen to, that was like backing up my concerns. So I was, just, and my husband was like, well, my fiance at the time was like, yeah, you know, I need to cut back. I'll try to cut back. Like, didn't really bat an eye at the alcoholic comment. Didn't get defensive, which he usually does. And I was like, this is weird. So I tell his parents about it. His parents come over because his other brother lives like two hours away and got wind of this and was like, absolutely. His wife is a nurse practitioner and is very much so like about family. We're all in this together. Um, his family typically brushes things under the rug and doesn't like to talk about them. Like if you don't think about it, it's not there. We don't have to deal with it. Um, but my sister-in-law encouraged her husband, like you need to get involved. This is not okay. This is a problem. So they kind of sort of a little intervention. Basically, his parents come over and they're like, you know, you need maybe we're too hard on you. Maybe work is too stressful because he does work. His business is a family business. Um, and his dad is verbally abusive, specifically to my husband. Um, but my husband mm. finds a lot of his worth in what his dad thinks about him. That's my perception. Mm -hmm. um, so he work was the reason why he was drinking and you know having poor coping skills that was the reason you know we had a reason so if we know the reason we can cut back on that so we get that all figured out we get married um we start trying for a baby it doesn't happen right away it takes about seven months to get pregnant um he starts getting sick he got really sick when i was seven months pregnant and at this point there had been several instances where the marijuana came up and I had told him you know what before it was like a deal breaker for me now because this was such a big part of your life I can tolerate you maybe doing this on a bachelor party or something or maybe doing this somewhere else like I was bending my boundaries because I loved him and I wanted to keep him and I knew what I had to do but I didn't want to have to do it because I love him so much and um, I still wasn't thinking cannabis hyperemesis at this point. We were thinking other GI stuff because we went to GI appointments and these other GI doctors, the second opinions, I was at all the appointments. So then he wasn't forthcoming and telling them how much he was smoking. So I'm, he gets sick. I'm very pregnant. I get him in the car because we're going to the hospital. And he had had probably two or three hospital admissions over 2014 up until this point, which was 2020. And... Mm -hmm. I look at him and I said, have you smoked recently? Because at this point, I wasn't smelling the weed on him. Because come to find out, he had been smoking through vape pens. So you can't really smell it as much and you can hide it more mm -hmm. easily. Mm -hmm. And I didn't find out until later. So we get in the car. I'm pregnant. I asked him, have you smoked recently? He says no. I look at him and I said, you know that they are going to drug test you when we get there. And they will tell me whether you have been smoking. So just go ahead and tell me. Like, it's, I don't understand what I've done for you to not feel like you can be honest with me and tell me what's happened. 
And he's like, no, I haven't. So we get there. The doctor says, we need a urine sample from you because we're going to drug test you. <laughs> Positive for cannabis. <laughs> and the doctor looks at me and I said, so how long would that be in his urine if he is a chronic, mm-hmm. like, whatever? He's like, three to four days. And I mm-hmm. look at him. The doctor walks out and I'm hysterical. And I was like, I'm a healthcare professional. I work here. Do not ever embarrass me like that again. I am here to help you. And at this point, I was just so frustrated with him. So he gets admitted to the hospital. I'm worried about him when I really should be taking care of myself because I'm pregnant. And I think this is the wake-up call for him. He tells me this is the wake-up call. I'm going to stop. He had never said, I'm going to go get help because he, he said he could do it on his own. So we have our child a few months later, and my child was born seven days before the shutdown happened with COVID. Mm-hmm. He was so amazing the week after, like when she was a week old. He was there to help me. He was so wonderful, and he is hands-on, and that's what's so – he was never really um, lazy or didn't do anything. He was always doing something, like, in the yard. I mean, but if I needed something done and asked him, he didn't do it. But if he needed something done, he was doing it. But he wasn't, like, a couch potato. So when she's a week old, he starts getting a little sick. And, of course, you know, COVID, like, everybody's freaking out about COVID. And you have a newborn, seven days old. He starts getting a cough. He starts throwing up. And I'm thinking he's got COVID. He's got all the symptoms of COVID. So we separate, like he leaves the house, my mom comes over to stay with me, I was like nobody in this house, nobody out of this house, it was just my mom and I. He went to his parents' house because his parents had been around him, so I'm thinking okay, you know, COVID stuff. So he goes to the doctor, um, they send him to the ER, they do a chest x-ray on him, he's got bilateral pneumonia, and I'm thinking this has to be COVID, he's a healthy 30-something year old. Um, there's no way that, like, this isn't COVID. And his brother had asked him, have you been smoking again? And he mm-hmm. says no. And it didn't even cross my mind to think about this because I'm, like, in postpartum AT double hockey sticks, like, you know, postpartum anxiety, COVID anxiety. So he goes, and we they test him for COVID. At this point, it was really hard to get a COVID test. So they test him for COVID, and – they it's negative so i'm thinking oh it's a false negative well our pediatrician like once he's hospitalized for five days and he had to wear oxygen while he was here it was a total nightmare i'm picturing the love of my life possibly having this horrible virus that everybody's getting being intubated while i'm not there or something which never happened but your mind goes to the worst um when he comes home from the hospital after five days he's on all these antibiotics so his his mom who is in, I don't want to be ugly, but she's very much so an enabler, and it's everybody else's fault. She, I'm not only taking care of my newborn and taking care of my husband over the phone, I'm advocating for him in the hospital when doctors aren't wanting to do a COVID test on him, all these things. So I'm telling his mom what medications he needs to take, when he needs to take them, and he had to be separated from us for a month because at the time – we didn't really know the rules on COVID and our pediatrician had recommended just to be safe because you have a newborn. This is what we need to do. So my mom stayed with me for a month and never thought anything else of it. We just thought, oh my gosh, this is something horrible that's happened to us. We got through it. He probably had COVID, but it was a false negative because these tests aren't very accurate when they first come out. So now this is the ending near the ending of my story. I'm sorry if this is taking a while. Stop me at any point. No, you're doing great. So he, this is, my daughter's four months old at the time. He starts getting sick again. And I just get this weird feeling. I'm like, I don't, something's not right. So he's sick. He's in the shower like his usual showering, using up all the towels in the house, using up all of our hot water, the usual when he has his stomach problems is what we call them. And I grabbed the baby and I set her in the crib 
and I know she's safe there and she's happy. So I set her there and I go out while he's in the shower and I go to his truck and I am looking through the truck. And a few weeks prior, I had seen like a vape pen in his truck, but his cousin rides with him for work a lot and his cousin works with him and also smokes weed constantly. But I was like, who's is this? And I didn't really know what it was because I'm sheltered, I guess. And he's like, oh, that's my cousin. And I was like, oh, okay. So I go to his truck when he's in the shower, and I find this little baggie, and it's got things that I've never seen in it. They are like little vape, uh, basically drug paraphernalia, but through a vape pen. And I open the bag, and I smell it, and it smells like straight up, like just smoke. But it didn't smell like weed, so I wasn't really Mm -hmm. sure. So I grab the baby, and I go into the shower. And at this point, um, through my recovery, I have now realized that instead of having a mental breakdown and instead of leaving, I numbed out, Mm. um, not realizing it. Because at this point, it was just like, I don't know. I just We started having really bad intimacy issues. Well, he didn't think that. I did. I had a very low sex drive even mm-hmm. before we got married. And I thought, well, you know, I'm a nurse. I have a really stressful job. Maybe that's it. And, oh, you know what? I've put on a few pounds. Maybe I'm just feeling blue because of that. Oh, let me change mm-hmm. my birth control. Maybe it's hormonal. You know, never thinking that this is a possibility that I've been through emotional trauma. And I still didn't mm-hmm. know that until earlier this year or last year now. So I walk in and I look at him and I said at what point are you going to stop lying to me and he said what are you talking about and I said I found these things in your truck and he said can we talk about this later I don't feel good and I said no we're going to talk about it now I said I'm taking the baby and I'm going somewhere and if you do not get help I will file for divorce I said I'm taking her I'm going somewhere I will let you know when I'm safe but I um I won't tell you where I am. So a few days pass by. My mom gets wind of what's going on. She has me call out of work because she's like, you need to get him help. That's what we do as wives. You need to get him help. So I made all his appointments for him. He was very well. He admitted finally, I've got a problem. I think I'm going through alcohol withdrawal. And at this point, he had been drinking two bottles of wine a night until he passed out on the couch and I couldn't wake him up. So she says, you're going to get him help. So we go, and we – I talk to his doctor. He's right there with me. He um, encourages us to do IOP, which is intensive outpatient programs, um, through a recovery center. And my insurance will pay for it if, as long as he's an alcoholic also. Like, it's really crazy mm-hmm. because if he's going for the weed, it's not going to cover it. So, but he is an alcoholic. So, of course, we agree to that. So, insurance covers it. He goes through this program. He's the star student. Um, He starts going to AA um, because that's part of the program requirement. He gets a sponsor. He's doing great. I'm very proud of him. Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. even a month after going to IOP, he still always talks like, I'm going to – I can't wait till I get to the point where maybe I can enjoy a glass of wine with you. And I was very upfront, and I said, that can't happen. That's a boundary for me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, he – I'm sorry. He um, was like, oh, okay, you know, if that's what I need to do, then that's what I'll do. So we um, – he still sees a sponsor but doesn't go to AA anymore. He kind of drops off that and uses COVID as an excuse, even though he's in COVID the whole time with all of this. So um, I'm there supporting him, and I still just don't feel like our marriage is in a good place. Um, so he is still – like, he's doing – I think it's hard because my family was telling me – my parents specifically – He's not drinking. He's not doing these things. And he wasn't. Um, We were doing drug tests, and I know that he wasn't. But he Mm -hmm. was also not in the recovery mindset. But I was like, well, he's sober. This should be good enough for me. He's a good dad, so this should be good enough for me. Mm -hmm. And 
I was like, this is something's not right. Like I'm still a piece is missing. I don't I don't feel lovey dovey towards him. I love him as a person, but I'm not feeling in love. So I start going to counseling myself. I never I hadn't done Alan on at this point and I hadn't heard about your podcast or anything. And I'm going to counseling and I went in and I was like, I think I want a divorce. And I'd never admitted that to myself because it's heartbreaking realization to say to yourself, this is where my marriage has gotten. Um, I was like, I'd like to, I, I don't know what to do. And she's like, well, it's really understandable that you're feeling this way because you've been through emotional trauma. And she was the first person that ever acknowledged that what I was going through wasn't okay. Because we had been to marriage counseling over the past, like, two years. We had gone to three different therapists, and they kind of dismissed us, like, oh, there's not too many issues going on here. Um, They didn't specialize in addiction. Um, Mine doesn't necessarily specialize in addiction, but she has done couples therapy with people struggling through addiction or in recovery. And so we started going to counseling together because I came back to her and I was like, you know, I do want to make this work because I told him, you know, I'm really struggling. I love you. I'm not feeling a spark anymore. And he was devastated. And of course I'm guilt is huge with me. I just felt so guilty. I, you know, I now have a daughter. I've been with him so long. Like what happens if I can't find any, anyone else? Like what if I'm alone forever? What if this is just as good as it gets? Cause I have my mom telling me, you know, do you really think the grass is greener on the other side? Um, he's not drinking anymore. My parents have been married for 35 years, and they've made it through, quote, storms in marriage and are glad they did. And they've said that to me, and I'm like, addiction, I've now realized through my recovery that addiction is not like a normal storm. And so we went to counseling, and I have come to the difficult decision um, that I am working on filing for divorce. After finding your programs, my cousin um, recommended that I listen to your podcast. And um, I said, you know what, I'm desperate at this point. I purchased the program because I was in limbo for so long. And those of you that are in limbo, you know how draining emotionally, physically, mm-hmm. limbo is just so stressful. Um mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's basically my story. I know that took a little while, but I felt like all those points were really important to mention. They are important. They are. That was awesome. So where are you now? Like, where, what are, where are you in the process today? Um, so I'm not done with the Stay or Go program, but I'm almost there. I'm about halfway through, probably. Um, I have retained an attorney. Um, I did move out. I had told my husband I was moving out. I moved back in with my parents because I felt like until I could find a place to rent and afford Mm -hmm. that, um, I felt like that was the most stable thing for my daughter. Um, They Mm -hmm. were not supportive, um, which is really, really sad to have people around you. All my friends are supportive, but my family doesn't Mm -hmm. understand. Um, Mm -hmm. Even when I tell them what I've been through, they – they think I'm throwing in the towel. And mm-hmm. um, we kind of got mm-hmm. into it a few weeks ago. So I moved back into the guest room at my husband and I's house that we just um, moved into. So I'm staying there until a rental is available, um, which is really hard living there because the boundaries, he's really pushing those. Um, what boundaries do you have in place while um, living with him? Um, while living with him, I, you know, through listening to the program and everything, I decided that the boundary was very important to have, like, nothing physical going on. Um, mm-hmm. And that quickly, because I'm still working on my boundaries, that quickly went downhill once I moved back in, kind of unexpectedly. Mm-hmm. He's very much so, like, wants to hug me and then wants it to lead to more. And the other day, mm-hmm. I, I drew that hard boundary and said, you know, we're not being intimate. And he immediately was, like, extremely passive-aggressive to me. Mm -hmm. Uh, Silent treatment, guilt-tripping, gaslighting. Um, Mm -hmm. But it's not so obvious, and I think that's the hard thing, is because 
I, I post in the private community. And I'm like, um, is this normal? Because I still find myself questioning whether it's as bad as I think it is. Mm. Um, but well, I know I'm following, I'm staying the course and I'm moving forward because I know in my heart what the answer is. And it's to divorce. Yeah. It sounds like you're, it sounds like you're on the way and really well on your way to learning to trust yourself again, which is so hard because trust is such a difficult word when we've been lied to and manipulated and put through so much trauma, like you said. It's really, really hard to trust anyone, particularly ourselves, when we have someone trying to convince us that we're crazy. And especially when you have family members kind of belittling what you're going through. That's really oh, hard. It's, a, it's um, very, very, very hard. Yeah. So I'm really proud of you because it sounds like you're finding your own, you're like finding your own trust within yourself because truly that's the only person in this scenario that you need to pay attention to or listen to, which is that, that little voice, that little instinct, that little gut knowing that's who you need to get in touch with again in order to direct you in a clear path. It's definitely not your, um, you know, uh, unhealthy people in your life directing you. Yeah. So it sounds and like you're I on the right. Go it's ahead. Definitely, it's definitely difficult, especially I think the more people that I talk to that are going through something similar, I think we all kind of can relate and in the fact that maybe we don't have a ton of self-confidence in anything that we hear yeah. in our head about ourselves when it's verbalized from someone that we love, that just reinforces that, and that makes it even harder. <laughs> totally. Absolutely. And especially when the messaging has been so negative for so long. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's years and years and years of believing this negative messaging. It takes a long time to reprogram that. And especially if they're within a very close distance, you know, living-wise, and if you're getting it from multiple people. And I also think you raised a very good um, point about um, – not knowing what's healthy and what's not, it's really hard to have a clear understanding of what a healthy relationship sounds like and feels like because it's been so dysfunctional for so long. That, oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. And so when, you know, you're being mistreated, it, you do – like I know you mentioned earlier, like the normalization of this dysfunction can be a very hurtful habit. Whereas if you are learning and you've had, you know, a healthy relationship modeled for you, like even if it's just a um, a relationship where two people are learning how to argue with one another, learning what to do when they disagree, if that hasn't been modeled for you as, you know, you were growing up or in your own home, it's really uh, difficult to understand what that sounds and looks like, which is why I think therapy is so key for you because your therapist can teach you, like, this is actually what it sounds and looks like when you're in a mutually respect, respective, honest relationship. Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> That's great that you're – I'm so proud of you for um, surrounding yourself with support. It sounds like you're doing all the right things. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I just want to tell people, too, I feel like it, it must be normal to second-guess yourself. I've heard you say that several times. Mm -hmm. um, and I do. I'm, I might sound, like, <laughs> very matter-of-fact through all this, but I second-guess myself all the time, and I just keep reminding myself – my daughter is my everything, and I – the last thing I want to do, I think that society has really taught us that being married for a long amount of time is, like, the goal, and I think that yeah. happiness is the goal, and I just think that if you're in a situation where you're not being respected and you're not, 
I don't think that when I took my vows that God said, like, you must be miserable forever. Like, I think that my husband left the marriage a long time ago. And I take my vows really serious, but I don't want my daughter thinking that she has to. If if this Mm -hmm. were her, I would never tell her, you need to stay. I would never Mm -hmm. tell her that. I would tell her, you follow happiness and do whatever you've got to do to find that. Well, and also, I mean, you're talking about safety, too, right? I mean, you're talking about, like, some of the instances that you mentioned, I was thinking in my head, well, thank gosh she didn't drive with her, you know, while oh. he's, yeah. I mean, you are, yeah, you're talking about physical safety. You're talking about the fact that if you have illegal, <coughs> excuse me, illegal <coughs> paraphernalia in your home, your daughter can be taken away from you, too. So there's a lot of things that also can pertain to your daughter. And I've done a lot of research on um, and read a lot of books about uh, children with alcoholics or growing up with alcoholic parents or addicted parents. And I've never read a book that or talked to somebody that said, I'm so grateful that I was brought up in a home with addiction. Like, I've never heard anyone thankful for that. So they've had to work through, as adults, a lot of pain and baggage and trauma for themselves growing up in that household. So I think I love your motivation for your daughter. Absolutely. Love it. Yeah. That's good. You're a good mom. Mm -hmm. You're a great mom. You're doing the right thing. I'm very proud of you. Thank you for sharing your story with me, and thank you for sharing it on this podcast. Thank you so much. I hope that it helps people, and I'm very thankful for the opportunity to be able to share it. Yeah, I know it will. I know it will. Okay, I'll talk to you later. Okay, thank you. This podcast is created for your support, encouragement, and entertainment with my personal thoughts and beliefs. We are bonded together by the fact that we love someone suffering from addiction. This is not intended as a substitute for therapy or advice from a professional.